Hello. 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 Oh, Hi. Hi. This is Terry and Tiffany from Craig Hello. Live Radio. How are you guys doing? Me. How are you? Great. We're good. We're good. All right. Well, let me do the official introductions because we are on air. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our two guests for this evening. First of all, we have one of the most influential women in Hollywood, I dare say. Uh, the founder and chairman of the Hollywood Museum. We're very excited to welcome Donnell Dadigan to the show. And, of course, a music legend of the group, the Pointer Sisters. You know them, you love them. We are so thrilled to welcome Miss Anita Pointer to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to hey, be here. welcome. Anita, we're being introduced. Yeah, isn't that sweet? <laughs> now, I've got to ask yeah. you two ladies. I'll, I'll ask Danelle first, and then we'll ask Anita after that. Uh, okay. Where were you guys, and what were you doing last night during the big earthquake? <laughs> well, actually, I'm going to let Anita answer that. She's got a story. <laughs> okay, i got to hear it. Okay, what happened to you, Anita? I was, home. I was home, and I was in my room, in my bedroom, and I'm upstairs. And my room was shaking like you wouldn't believe, scared me to death. <laughs> and I called, I intercommed my granddaughter who was downstairs in the studio. Uh -huh. And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, there's an earthquake going on right now. She said, I don't feel anything. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. She didn't feel anything. She was downstairs and she didn't feel it. But I felt it up here. And it really scared me. So I got all my earthquake equipment and my backpack and all my Uggs. And I put them by the door. <laughs> <laughs> ready to run well you know i was playing your song jump for my love and i thought the song was just really good but but all of a sudden i started jumping and i hadn't planned on it it just it, it was just a crazy thing that was really scary though man that was i, I hope i hope well, that's that, a perfect the perfect song for an earthquake. <laughs> I, I hope that, uh, you know, your exhibit at the Hollywood Museum didn't get knocked down. I mean, is everything okay there at uh, oh, Museum Central? Okay. I went over, I went today, and I went through, every, everything's fine. Okay, the good. The museum is strong, and it's the whole, everything, nothing moved at all. Wow. Well, you know, I've got to ask, uh, I definitely want to find out. Place. Go ahead, sorry. I say the museum is a solid port in place concrete building with rebar reinforcement and it was probably one of the only buildings did not move during the Northridge earthquake nor did it move during the tunneling of Metro Rail about 10 years ago or so. Wow. And you know that's the thing yeah, too, the thing is so cool about the museum and, and uh, very smart not only as far as paying homage to history but also in the fact of being sturdy like you said in an earthquake that it's the original Max Factor building right? Yes, it is. And, you know, talking about all this construction, I don't know if anyone knows. Anita, I'm not even sure if I shared it with you. Do you know that Max Factor had a bomb room upstairs on the fourth floor where we threw our opening night party? What? And he used ex room. Yeah, he, is, <laughs> he used explosive charges to mix the color in his powder products. What? Wow, that's wow. incredible. Yes, and you know, yeah. I think it's strong. You know, not a you know, and move at all. It's solid. And what's okay. kind of fun for all makeup lovers is is that the explosive charge left a little bit of an iridescent residue in the powder. And, in fact, during Twiggy's time, and I'm dating myself, uh, that, uh, that that uh, iridescent color was very popular. Uh, that was added to all the shimmer was added to all the different colors uh, for eyeshadow. And, again, it's popular now. So, you know, what goes round comes round. Right. Yeah, well, kudos to you, Danelle, that... Uh, I, I guess you actually preserved uh, the original makeup room, or at least part of that museum, to where uh, Max Factor did their thing. Is that right? Yes, we preserved the original makeup rooms, the blondes only room where Marilyn Monroe became a blonde. Mm -hmm. uh, I know everyone's always says, "Oh, but she was born a blonde." But by the time she was a teenager, like most natural blondes, her hair turned darker, and it was in that very room that Max Factor gave her the heightened blonde color that we know her as. Wow. And there's a redhead's only room where Lucille Balby had got her signature red hair. There's a brunette's and a brownette's only room. So wow. it was all about the hair color, not your complexion color, but your hair color for Max Factor. And based on your hair color, 
he then went off of that to figure out what is the right color for your complexion, what color should your lips be painted, your eyeshadow, your rouge, and so on. Wow, I've got to ask you, Anita, th this is really fun for me to be able to talk to you. Now, I, I would assume, okay, that, that you might remember this, or it was even you, because I was so excited. I didn't even remember, like, I'm, you know, my memory is fading a little bit. I'm, I'm 62 years old. I'm kind of up there. You know, I'm not like a young chicken. I'm a young chicken. Thank you. But anyway, uh, I, I believe I met you because we were in Vegas, and we went to see a Prince tribute show by a group called Purple Rain. Were you there? I remember that. Okay, now you yeah. may remember you were sitting in your seats and there was two excited fans that was behind <laughs> you. One was an older guy and one was a girl and you and your lovely sister turned around and talked to us and, and it was us. <laughs> Really? Oh yes. my goodness, I remember being at that show. That's incredible. I really saw in concert and this was as much as I got. It was just beautiful. It was, they were so good. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I that was great that we got a chance to talk that night. I remember being excited about the show, so <laughs> Yay, what do we say? Well, I, I, I'll tell you, it was funny because I don't remember which of you said what, but one sister noticed that we were all excited back there. And, of course, we're in radio. We had to be cool. We didn't want to act like we were fans, you know. But we were. We were totally fanboying out. We were totally fanboying out. And I kept saying to Tiffany, I'm like, is that the Pointer Sisters? <laughs> no, that can't be the Pointer Sisters. It's the Pointer Sisters. And, and one of one of you turned around and said to the other one, "We got some fans back there, honey. You better turn around and talk to these people." <laughs> and you were you were so nice to us. You were so nice to us. Thank you so much for talking to oh, us. Oh, well, that's fabulous. We're always nice. That's so nice. Yeah, I remember that show. That was a really good show. It was, that was really good. Are, are you a Prince fan? I mean, is that why you went to see them or? Yeah, I was. Well, I am a Prince fan. I never really go saw him. I saw him kind of in concert at his club. He had a club in L.A. Yeah. At right. one time. I can't remember the name of it, but he had a club in L.A. And I went there one night, and he, like, did an impromptu appearance. Came up and started jamming and singing, and that's as much as I ever saw of him live, because he was always... I always heard about his fabulous concerts, where he would come in from the back of the room and... Mark down the aisles at the you know at uh, Universal Amphitheater and all that and but I I never got to see it because I was always on the road right mm -hmm. I was always working right. never got to see him but uh, I just heard so much about him and and we got to go to Paisley Park to record mm. at his studio when we did the Motown album uh, Right Rhythm and he came to the studio and he came in and and he was so wonderful he came in and hugged us and was so happy to see us and welcomed us to his studio he showed us the purple rain room with all the pillows and put the whole psychedelic thing and i sat on the motorcycle <laughs> the purple rain and he took us on a tour of his his uh building that had his manufacturers making all his clothes wow. and shoes and everything they made all his stuff right there at the uh, paisley park studios Wow. That was really a great experience, and we recorded with um, Sir Ivan Caesar, his bass player, mm -hmm. and um, but but Prince was there. He was just so sweet and so wonderful and so happy to see us. He also came to visit us at our studio here at Studio Fifty Five in L.A. with Richard Perry. Wow! One day and us and. Well, you have been working a whole lot. I cannot believe, I mean, let's talk about the exhibit because this is celebrating 50 years of the Pointer Sisters. It hasn't been 50 years. Ah, it has been over 40 years. We've been on the road, and including the backup singing years. Wow. It has. <laughs> you know, we were backup singers for Elvin Bishop, for Cold Blood, for uh, Boss Gags, for uh, Taj Mahal, Dave Mason, uh, and working in the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, in the late 60s. Wow. 
So, so how um, did, uh, and Donnell, maybe you can tell us uh, how you, I don't know who got the idea. You guys can both tell me. How did the exhibit come about? How, who thought, hey, this would be an interesting thing, and how did you find out uh, that Anita had enough to fill the exhibit? <laughs> oh, Anita, we're both chuckling, but you answered. It's a great story. <laughs> it is. I happened to meet Donnell at an Oscar party. She had an Oscar party at the museum. Mm-hmm. And I told my Carol Lemire about it, and she said, that's my friend. She owns the place. <laughs> 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 she said, I'm going to talk her. She said, because she knew what I had. I've been collecting since the 70s. Mm-hmm. I collected, every, I just kept things. I'm, I'm like that. I keep, even my personal stuff. I just, I'm just, I hold on to things. I just love having, I don't know, maybe it's coming from nothing, you know, coming from open where I had nothing, and especially no clothes. I, when I get clothes, I take care of them, and I've cherished them, and I've, I, I, I spend good money for them and I want them to be okay and so I just started in the 70s you know collecting things and I just kept going I just kept doing it now you were talking about so I ran uh, mail though at the museum mm-hmm. and we she finally you know we got to talk and I told her about what I had I'd been trying to get an exhibit up for years and she offered me the second floor well actually she came over first and saw what I had Mm -hmm. she offered us the whole second floor wow Hollywood Museum and I thought at first it was going to be the biggest I didn't think we were going to have enough to fill it up (laughs) 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 that's opposite I had to bring things back home I still have enough stuff here for another exhibit (laughs) I swear we had to bring things back because it's so much stuff it's just so much stuff it's just so beautiful i just love it so much now you were talking about prince in in the fact that he had a lot of his clothes made and had them made by his own people there you with with your outfits i mean you turned around and got hooked up with a famous designer that made clothes for Cher. yes bob mackie bob mackie was wonderful he worked with us on the carol burnett show and the Cher show lip wilson show but he he was just wonderful, and he gave us some beautiful clothes. I mean, we, we worked with Carol, and, and after the show was done, they said we could keep the clothes. We were just dying. Wow. We were like, I can't believe they're giving us these clothes. Some of the things were our clothes that he redesigned, and some of the things were complete new Bob Mackey designs that he did for us. I'm just so grateful. I was so great, so grateful, and still so grateful that they did that for us. Well, that's incredible. I, I know you said at first that you weren't sure you had enough to fill up the space, and you realize you have enough to fill up an even bigger space, or maybe like a part two. How how did you decide what to put on display and not, or did maybe Danelle have a part of that? Donnell did, and her team, and, you know, Steve, and Gail, and uh, Gina, and, and Roxy, my granddaughter, and Melissa. We went through the clothes, and we kind of, it was really difficult. It really is hard to pick and choose which to put up and which not to put up. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we just had to make a choice. Right. Now, uh, it, it's really phenomenal. We even have a disco ball and a dance floor uh, yeah. on the second floor with the with the Pointer Sisters music, you know, blasting at high level, and so many of our visitors come, they see the exhibit, they look at the costumes, they recognize some, and they dance on the dance floor, and they just have a great time. They don't want to leave. Right. It's so fun. It really is. It's just a beautiful exhibit. It's so colorful and festive. I mean, I, I just, I'm, I'm amazed at how wonderful it came out, and I'm thankful to Roxy and Alvin and Melissa and Kaz and JT and all of them that came up there and really worked. Steve and Doug, you know, they're working in, into the night, just getting things in order. And Odila yeah. came yeah. in and steamed all the... It's just, it's just a whole... It takes a lot, you know, it does. You know, I didn't do it. It's, it's it, a family affair. Really well, it really is. is. And, and, you know, it was a family... Uh, family affair before I, I believe we went through you Danelle I'm not sure but you had a previous exhibit to where you had 
uh, the clothes and artifacts from David Carradine. And we had an interview with David yeah. Carradine's widow, and we had Mariah Carradine, his granddaughter, there in the studio that night with us, and she talked to her too. And I was talking to them about it, and 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 let me ask uh, Anita. Uh, you know, uh, they said that the thing that was really weird to them what was seeing David's clothes there on the mannequin and that. Now, luckily, we still have Anita with us. God, God bless you, Anita. We love you so much. But what is it like looking up there and seeing your clothes on the mannequins, and especially seeing uh, the clothes of your other two sisters? I mean, is well, is it kind of strange? And knowing that sadly we lost June, too. Yeah, we lost June, and that is hard to see. I, I thought about her. I cried about it. It's really, 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 really hard. It's really so hard. I, I miss it so much. Oh yeah. my God, I can't believe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's certainly a fitting tribute. I mean, it's a wonderful thing you guys have done uh, to turn around and, and display it like this. Uh, so I, I want to know, like, what has the reaction been of, of the people uh, visiting? I know the, the thing that the uh, Hollywood Museum does, which is great, is you always have a red carpet affair, and you have a lot of celebrities there that night. But, you know, aside from that, because it's been open for a while now, uh, what has some of the feedback been from the people that's visited uh, the exhibit? Well, you know, um, it's Janelle here, and I, I'll just tell you that a lot of the visitors love to come and see this they actually point out certain of the pointer sisters costumes uh and say they remember anita wearing this or bonnie wearing this and and they remember when they performed in san francisco mm -hmm. or in vegas or you know in new jersey uh it's so interesting you know cross country their tours and it brings back memories the thing about the hollywood museum is that it's all about uh, bringing back wonderful memories and evoking a time that you enjoyed in your life and therefore you become very open to learn more about the exhibit right. and we watch our visitors spend you know half hour to an hour very uh, uh, very methodically uh, going through looking at the costumes reading all the text panels looking at the photographs and discussing it with their friends and it's so much fun because they're also talking about a time from once upon a time when they went to see the Pointer Sisters live or they remembered buying an album and they were at an all-girls party playing the music or it was at one of the school dances. And it's so cool to listen to all of this because it just evokes great memories and those great memories uh, evoke a great interest in Anita's exhibit. And I mean, I have to just tell you uh, as, as I'm just chit-chatting away here, but Terry and Tiffany, let me tell you, uh, Anita has done a phenomenal job of collecting, not only preserving her costumes, but they are so pristine. I mean, she took no shortcuts when it came to saving them and preserving them for all this time. They look fabulous today. And we've had several of the de original designers come in and take a look at them and cannot believe the condition that these costumes are still in, and that's because of Anita's uh, ability and desire to really take good care of these costumes. She realized how important it was. It is. It's so important. You know, I've got to ask you, Anita, because that brings up a question. We were talking about preservation, and my, my notes could be wrong here, and maybe you can correct me if they are. Uh, you did such a great job in preserving the costumes and, and everything that you have. Uh, according to my notes, uh, there was a big story that we've been covering a lot of uh, Universal Studios, when they had a fire a couple of years ago, lost some original master recordings of recording artists. And I'm under the impression, according to my notes, that some of the original master tapes that they lost in the fire were tapes of the Pointer Sisters. Is that right? That's right. I saw that on, uh, on the Internet. I saw that my, our name is on the list. Mm -hmm. Along with hundreds of other artists, wow. masters have been burned, and I, I don't know what I don't know what's happening with that. I turned it over to my attorney and go to find out what's going on. You know, what you're gonna do about it. So at this point, you have no idea what songs were were burnt. I have no idea. I just know that I saw my name for the pointers mm -hmm. on that list, so I <laughs> immediately turned it over to my attorney to find out what 
are they doing? Are they having a class action lawsuit? Mm-hmm. What are what are they doing? Are they finding out? You know, are they compensating mm-hmm. the artists for this? You know, material that they've lost of theirs because they pay for that. Yeah, I, I heard you talk about in an interview. Because uh, the question was poised to you about how you would do things differently, and you had talked about how when you get into the business that you don't realize about the business end of it a lot of times, and you don't have ownership of a lot of your songs and stuff. And you wish you would have known those things that you know now, and then to find out that master tapes were destroyed because they really didn't, you know, in my opinion anyway, didn't properly store them. I mean that that's a really sad thing to know that, that thing went up like that. To know that you already have to deal with copyright and ownership and, and not getting royalty you deserve to know that Master Tapes got burned up like that. Yeah, that's true. You know, when you're a new artist and you can first get into the business, that contract is <laughs> as a joke. <laughs> you know, and uh, we went through that. We went through that. You know, all the stuff that we did in the beginning all owned by someone else. Wow. Mm-hmm. So as... And as they said, they own it for 57 years. Yeah. So I got a few more years to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few more years to go that I'm going to be fighting. Right, right. Give me back my publishing and, you know, it's really not fair, but it's what you just want. It's what it is. What yeah. it all was like that. Well, thank God for the museum exhibit. And, and once again, and then I'll move on to something else here. I'm really sorry about the master tapes uh, being gone. And have your lawyer okay. check because I did hear there is going to be a class action lawsuit. And I, I think. I would think so. Because yeah. there's so many artists. I couldn't believe the list. I couldn't believe it's hundreds of, of artists on that list. Mm-hmm. Now, see, I think. Dan- I, I think Danelle should offer to store the tapes at the Hollywood Museum and then they might be safer. <laughs> Yes, it's fireproof. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just thinking the next time there's an earthquake, I'm gonna just haul butt down to the Hollywood Museum and bunker up in there. <laughs> well, I, I can imagine, you, you know, it, it's got to be hard for for you too, Janelle, because being, you know, the the Hollywood fan that you are of of all the people that you display secretly. Now, let me tell you a secret: if I was you, after the museum closed, I'd be putting those clothes on. <laughs> Well, you know, that's a fabulous thing. And I'm going to tell you that there's a great actress who actually donated uh, most of her collection to the museum about uh, 10, 12 years ago when mm-hmm. we were first opening. And uh, she had invited me to a big event, and Clint Eastwood was sitting at the table and several right. other celebrities. And she's announcing to everybody, oh, this is Danelle Daddigan. She just opened up the Hollywood Museum and the historic Max Factor building. and. I donated decades of my costumes and my uh, clothing that I wore for nightclub acts. And so he said, so tell me, honey, what's your favorite one? I think uh, I told her I don't have a favorite. They're all so fantastic, as as diplomatic as I could be. And she said, you know, I think such and such a costume would look fabulous on you. You really should wear it. I bet you've tried it on. (laughs) <laughs> and I looked at her and I told her, I said, you know, I have to be honest with you, I would never try one of your costumes or anyone's costumes on, even the ones we have bought for the museum. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, there's DNA on them. I wouldn't <laughs> want to change it. I wouldn't want to stretch the material. I'm afraid that, you know, I would uh, break a few seams and, and stitching and maybe the zipper would break because I'm obviously uh, bigger than you are. And she looked at me and she says, oh, my dear. She said, you answered the question perfect. I'm sending more clothing over to you this week. <laughs> so, you see? I uh, See, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure Anita... <laughs> I'm sure Anita would catch it too. Like she'd be like, "I didn't notice that ketchup stain on there when I, when I first gave you that outfit." And all of a sudden, there it is. Now I've I've got to ask. Know, Anita and I love. I was to say Anita and I love uh, having French fries at Mel's Drive-in next door, and we do use ketchup, but we don't wear the costumes over there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Now Terry, don't put words in my mouth. Oh. <laughs> And, and and I was excited that I hung out with Anita in Vegas, and now here I could have had French fries at Mel's Drive-In. I mean, seriously. Now, I've got to ask you. Well, I'm coming to L.A. <laughs> there, it's, a, it's a date. It's a date. I've got to ask you, Anita, because one thing that you guys did that I thought was great, and that is early on, being little girls living in Oakland, uh, you had loved all kinds of music. And I know your mom even bought you some Elvis Presley records and so forth. And and knowing that 
you decided that that you ladies were not going to be typecast or locked into a certain genre. You said you love music, period, and you did different kinds right. of music. And you were the first black artist to perform at the Grand Ole Opry with a country and western kind of song called Fairy Tale. Right, that's right. A song that me and Bonnie wrote, and it was amazing. I mean, we I, I didn't start out to write a country song. I was sitting in a motel a motel room in <laughs> Woodstock, for being, we were the backup singers for Dave Mason, uh-huh. and I was listening to a James Taylor cassette. And I started writing, and I wrote fairy tale, and then I got Bonnie to help me finish it. And we took it to our band; they didn't even want to play it. They were like, "We didn't want. We ain't in the, just to do no country music." And you know, <laughs> our drummer got up and walked out. But we won our first Grammy award for fairy tale. Wow! A story about a relationship that I had, you know, back in the seventies, and. Um, Elvis recorded it, we went to the Grand Ole Opry and performed it, and it was just, I don't, I mean, they didn't have social media back then, so it wasn't like, what was the guy's name, Nas X and, and Billy Ray Cyrus, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't get no recognition for what we did, we were the first black act to ever f- perform at the Grand Ole Opry, but they didn't say nothing about it. Right. We got our first Grammy Award for a country song. They didn't say nothing about it. Hmm. You know, just, I don't, you know, we we really have broke a few, we tore down a few walls. Yes. But that, that Grand Ole Opry, they loved us and they showed us love. You know, even though we were the first black act to ever perform there, they gave us so much love. They had a big party for us. <laughs> wow. They, they thought we were the help, so they sent us to the back door. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, there, there must have been something that, that you... David Rubinson, he had a fit, because he said, they're not the help, they're the, they, they're the honored guests. <laughs> it was in a big old country mansion in Nashville. Wow. And... Uh, it was just really, really not. I mean, really. I mean, we went back. We did a photo shoot, and uh, it was, it was. I, you know, I thought it was a great accomplishment, but nobody knew about it but us. You know, they didn't say nothing about it. They didn't talk about it on the news or on. You know, it, it's just too bad. But we did do our part in trying to correct some of the wrongs of. Right. You know, because when we were at the Grand Ole Opry, I, my manager, David Rubinson, who was a jewel who got us through the... Uh, he opened it, the gates for us. But he told us they were protesting our, our being there. And really? I didn't even know it. But I was so excited and so into just getting out there and doing our performance, I didn't even see the protesters. But he told me later, he said, yeah, they were out there. They had signs saying, keep country music country. Wow. You know, which country music white that, that music is really white. that is really so hypocritical because I can't remember the, the timeline but there was a, a black country artist by the name of Charlie Pride and, and Charlie Pride yeah he only won, and he, I put his picture on the album cover because he was black there you go and he was there he was the only other black person I remember meeting mm-hmm. at the Grand Ole Opry yeah wow there. Well, you certainly broke down walls. Now, I, I guess because of uh, that that song, which led to a, a great title, are you not writing a book called Fairy Tale? Yes, we are. Because our our career, our success, what we had is, has been really like a fairy tale. You know, it's been a a dream come true. Where I used to sit up and just fantasize about being on stage and singing. You know, like Gladys Knight and. Mm-hmm. All the great ones that were out back then, you know, back in the 50s and the 60s. So, uh... I'm I'm still amazed. I'm still shocked that I look at some of our old videos and things that I did, and I'm like, oh, my God! (laughs) I really got to do this. I really got to perform before thousands of people. I really got to do this. And it still just blows me away. It really does. It really, really does. I'm still so honored, so blessed, so grateful, so thankful that I had the opportunity to do what I did. Now, correct me if I'm Good. wrong, Anita. I think you're. Are, aren't you actually working on two books? Two 
two books. Yeah, I, well, I'm working on a, a wardrobe book that, you know, catalogs all the things that we've done at the museum. That's one, one of the things I want to get out so people can take it home and look at it. Nice. What was there at the Hollywood Museum. Now, you know, I'm also working on a book called Fairy Tale with my brother Fritz, uh, Fritz Pointer, and we're about the Pointer sisters and the Pointer family history. That includes my cousins and daughter and my nephews and my pieces and all that stuff. Right. Now, for fans that are listening, uh, if you're able to get out to the Hollywood Museum, they do actually have a fantastic gift shop there as well. Um, you can pick up stuff. But I wanted to ask uh, Donnell and Anita, is there any chance they can pick up items, Anita, from your jewelry line in the gift shop? We're going to have it online so people can, so we make it easy for everyone to be on, to be able to get it online. We're working on that now. Perfect. It's coming very. Perfect. Well, another question. Really we're, <laughs> we're getting questions being submitted as we're doing the interview here. Um, and somebody was asking uh, if we could ask Donnell to tell us the story of how and why she ended up securing the Max Factor building. Uh, because one thing that's great, and, and I know that I believe, Donnell, that you were actually good friends with uh, Johnny Grant. But it's great to see somebody who's actually interested in preserving Hollywood's legacy. Unfortunately, so many times nowadays, people either don't care or they're ready to bulldoze in the interest of putting up some new sky rise. Um, and that's totally right. not the case with you. So how did uh, securing the building and, and the whole idea of opening the museum come about? Well, call me crazy. You know, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I just guess. You know, I thank goodness I had no idea what I was uh, in store for me. And, uh, you know, I to this day, I thank my mother for allowing me to make my dream of having a Hollywood museum a reality. Because it was not so easy. No, and I thanks bet. to Hollywood's honorary mayor, John Grant, oh my goodness, Johnny was my first friend in Hollywood, and he was my best friend, and he was my mentor. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for Johnny Grant, I would have sold the Max Factor building and made Boku bucks mm -hmm. and oh. moved on to something else. But yeah. let me tell you, and I tease, I tease everybody all the time when I say that because I would never have done it, but I will tell you, there were so many people that wanted to have so many roadblocks and stumbling blocks for us. But thanks to Johnny Grant uh, yeah. and the councilman at the time, uh, who was Jackie Goldberg, subsequently our... Uh, Councilman uh, Eric Garcetti, who became the mayor of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and uh, would you believe one of his uh, aides was council was Mitchell Farrell, who became our council member mm -hmm. and is our council member now. Thanks to all of these wonderful folks uh, in Los Angeles, they have helped me make the Hollywood Museum a reality, and we preserved this fabulous building. It's a historic landmark building, not only local, state, but also national landmark building. It's a landmark building because it is a historic Art Deco Hollywood Regency style building, right. but also is a historic landmark for cultural reasons. It's the first time women, well, not like you, uh, not like you, Tiffany, not like you, Anita, but like me, who is a professional. I used to teach school once upon a time, and uh, was, and in, in real estate, a professional woman such as a school teacher or an assistant or a secretary or a shopkeeper or a doctor's assistant, uh, we were able to wear a little bit of makeup if prudently applied. And it was Max Factor who allowed us women in the early 30s to be able to do that. And uh, gone was the term hussy right. because that's what women were called. But thanks to Max Factor and this fabulous Art Deco Regency-style building that he uh, has on Hollywood and Highland, which we've now made the Hollywood Museum, thanks to that building, it was so glamorous that all high society ladies came in and helped be able to make it okay for professional women and society women to wear a little bit of makeup if prudently applied. So there's a lot of great stories that are attached to this building, so of course, I wanted this building for the museum. What better place? Right. You know, if these walls could talk. Yeah. 
Right. All of the movie star greats got their looks in these makeup rooms, whether it was Rita Hayworth, was it was Lana Turner, Marilyn Monroe, uh, Barbara Stanwyck, I mean, Judy Garland, Angela Lansbury, you know, and the list goes on and on and on, and Lucille Ball. But uh, I always thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun if we could recreate all of this? And it started that way, and thanks to Procter & Gamble, who owned Max Factor Cosmetics Company at the time, um, I was able to talk them into selling the building because, of course, you know, Tiffany, and Anita already knows this, mm-hmm. we women, we love things, especially when it's not easy to get them. Right. And uh, <laughs> the Max Factor building, uh, yeah. and, and the Max great thing- building was not for sale. Oh. But we talked them into it. Wow. wow. And, and it's, it's got to be great for you, Anita, because... The one thing that you can say about the Pointer Sisters, there's two words, and that's class and glamour that you ladies had. And, and to be display, uh, displayed like that on there, I mean, it's got to be incredible. Uh, I, I really didn't even understand that the Hollywood Museum was going to display uh, people from the recording industry, uh, uh, singers and such. I thought it was just basically for actors. Were, were the uh, the Pointer Sisters one of the only ones that are on display for the music industry, or is there others? I think we're the first, and that's a great new start there for you everybody. Go. You know, you kids need to see this. They need to know, you know, the history of the music industry and mm-hmm. how we contributed to the, you know, the culture in, in America. And they, they need to see this, and I'd love to have some. You have to have some of the young schools come in and do some tours at the museum. They really need to do that because I remember, as a young girl, when high school in Oakland took us to the D Young, D. young Museum in San Francisco, and yeah. I, I, I remember it. You know, I never forgot it. It was just <clears throat> something that was really impressive in my mind, and and the clothes that they wore back in the. Wells Fargo stagecoach days. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I've got to ask you, Nita. Of course, this is a great honor, but there was there was two things. We have, you know, they see those old antique dresses. That's right. Shows we did of stuff that still they love. Oh my God, I could do that. <laughs> some of those outfits I saw you wear on some of those shows, that they were. They were groundbreaking. I mean, they were seriously awesome. But I, I've got to ask you, because you did two things that our listeners are wanting to ask you about. You know you're famous when you do something for Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. That really made me feel good. I'm so proud of that. And they loved us. We did that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It was so cool. I just love it. And it's still running. They still run these things, you know. And Oh, and I, I took my daughter and our kids over, and they had us all singing, and it was just so much fun. I just love it. I love it. I'm so proud to have been a part of that. I really am. And then Disneyland, and, you know, we had a display at Disneyland for years. Wow, that's really incredible. And, and then the other thing, too, is, you know, I mentioned... And, and you confirm that you're one of the first music acts to be displayed at the Hollywood Museum. But in a way, you also fit in there with the fact that you have been in a couple of movies. You were not only in Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band with the Bee Gees, but you also was in an iconic film that we love here with Richard Pryor by the name of Car Wash. Oh, that was so much fun. What an experience. And it, was just, it happened just the way you would imagine the Hollywood situation would happen. We were in at a friend's apartment and Gary Stromberg came in and said, I'm doing this movie called Car Wash. And I said, put us in the movie, you know. <laughs> I said, me and my sister Ruth, we were there at, at Idita's apartment. Mm-hmm. And she said, she was a friend of Gary's. And he said, okay. And he put us in the movie. Wow. And we ended up, because we were really hot at the time too. That's another thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> We had hit records out, we were doing great, we were on every TV show, and so he put us in car wash, and we had the most fun, I'm telling you, I just can't wait to do it again. <laughs> it's been all these years. Well, they even featured <laughs> you in... I've been waiting in, all these years <laughs> to do it again. They even featured oh, you God. in the trailer, we, we have a, uh, an audio trailer we play on the station here, which was the, the movie trailer that they, they played on TV and stuff, and they mentioned the soundtrack with the Pointer Sisters. Yeah, yeah, we did. You got to believe with Norman Whitfield. 
he was the producer of the song, and, and we we should have had the car wash theme song, but his group was um, oh god, what's the name of the group? Sorry, I can't think of it. Um, That's okay. Yeah, but anyway, his, his group was was the group that did the original you know car wash theme song movie. But, Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce. That, you know, I was just getting ready to say that. Rolls yeah. Royce. That's right. That was his group. And so Norman Whitfield gave his group the theme song, and everybody thought it was us. But we did, you got to believe. And, and it, I'm just glad to have been a part of the movie because it's a classic. It, it's a classic really. It's a classic Richard Pryor movie. And I know uh, Rich, yeah. Richard Pryor's son was just recently uh, had the a people thing. people that are in that movie. It's wow! So funny. Yeah. It's so funny. I just can't. I wish they would do it. You know, I think they tried doing a car wash too, but it didn't really do anything. Yeah. So they need to do it. Again. What What about Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band? How was that for you? Well, you know what? I only was in the finale, and that was really fun. We had a big party. I remember um, Curtis Mayfield. Tina Turner and all these people being there and it was just really just a big old I was there for the after party of the movie I did I wasn't in the movie mm-hmm. I was in the finale yes mm-hmm. yes finale and where everybody was, sings and and one of my my favorite singers got to sing and that was uh, Billy Preston I love Billy Preston <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, oh my god I love Billy Preston yeah, it was really good. It was just fun just being there. And I told him, I said, well, you know, just give me screen credits. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll be happy with that. And in, that's all I got was, in was talking, fun being at the party. In talking about uh, collections and being a collector, I mean... Anita, you were kind of perfect uh, to end up working with the Hollywood Museum because we know about all of the amazing uh, memorabilia that you kept from the, your career with the Pointer Sisters. But also you have, and while this may not fit in the Hollywood Museum, you also have another collection that I guess even Sotheby's had mentioned was amazing, and that is you, you have like a Black History, Black American collection, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I thought it was very interesting. Yes, I do. I have a black memorabilia collection and uh, black Americana, as some people call it. It's, it's, I started collecting back in the early 80s. I went to Little Rock, Arkansas, and I was being inducted into the Black Hall of Fame in Little Rock. And I met Governor Huckabee at a presentation it was very very nice and then on the way to my mom's hometown Prescott Arkansas I stopped at an antique store and I found this little guy called Dancing Sam mm-hmm. and it was just so funny to me he was like a wooden little guy with movable arms and legs and you put him on a piece of plywood and you tap the plywood and he dances and the, the caption on the packaging said hours and hours of fun for you to do. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny to me because I'm like these kids are in the computers now they don't even I got to you know, kids sitting there with a little wooden toy just playing with it for hours and so I bought it and then I just started everywhere I'd go I'd look for black memorabilia after Little Rock I just started looking and from the early, from like like 1980, I just started going into antique stores and looking for black memorabilia, and it's really interesting. All over the world, they have it. You know, I found things in Australia, in New Zealand, in Belgium, you know, and all over. So, <clears throat> and a lot of the things are made in China. Wow. A lot of the things made in Japan, you know, but it's... Um, it was just really interesting to me to see how they caricatured uh, black people from America and from the world, and it was kind of disturbing. But then again, yeah, I was going to say because it's interesting to me that here you are, a, a, you know, a black icon, uh, somebody that really paved the way for many other black artists. And, and back in the day, you know, with black cinema, with, with the black actors and stuff, a lot of times the way they portrayed them is quite controversial in the fact that a lot of African Americans look down on that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. 
That's true. I mean, a lot of the stuff, like the one bank I have where there's a little black man sitting behind a donkey, and when you put the money in the bank, the donkey kicks the man in the head. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 it's, it's history. It's, yeah. it's history, and we don't want to repeat it. Right. Yeah. And, so and, and that, just, there were so many great artists like, you know, Manton Moreland and, and so forth. And he, you know, a lot of people was like, well, why do you want to act like that? And he was just, I just wanted to work, you know. But things yeah. really came so far with, with you and your sisters. I, I mean, you know, like I said, to be able to play Nashville and everything. I mean, you got to be proud you paved the way for African-Americans. I think so. I'm very proud. I'm very, very proud. You know, we did a lot of television back in the days and just letting the young black people know that you can push through all this discrimination. Right. Well, I got to find out because you had made a statement, uh, because I know you had a a solo career too, and you had some great solo recordings, Uh, but you have recently said that in some form or another, now, I know, luckily, you still have your sister with you, and you have other family members that I guess have joined in and sung with you from time to time, that you would like to see a current incarnation of the Pointer Sisters on stage again. Is there any plans on anything happening? Well, all in my head, there are plans. <laughs> I love my singing with my sister Ruth and singing with my sister Bonnie, and they're still here. So I just pray and hope that maybe someday we'll get to do something together again. I really do. Donnell, here's what you do. You have a Pointer Sisters reunion concert on the roof of the Max Factor building. Ah! Hey, that sounds great. (laughs) Hey, man, it worked for the Beatles. You know, I mean, it worked for the Beatles. So you you would have entertainment tonight. and put it out as a movie. Hey, I love it. <laughs> it's fabulous. That's great. All right. Well, as we <laughs> as we wrap things up here, I want to let everybody know uh, that they can go and visit the Hollywood Museum. Uh, you guys are open Wednesday through Sunday, I believe, from ten to five. Um, tickets are only fifteen dollars, um, and you know it, it goes down from there. Actually, uh, sixty-two and over, it's only twelve bucks. Students, if you have an ID, then it's only twelve bucks, and children under five is only five dollars. You guys are located right on the corner of Hollywood and Highland, uh, so uh, let's do shameless self promotion. I'll go around the room, and both of you let uh, our listeners know where they can find you guys on the internet, whether it's website, Facebook, Twitter, any of that good stuff. Oh, okay, Anita, you first. Oh goodness, I, I think I have a Twitter account and Facebook and. and- Instagram and all that stuff, but I, I don't really know. You, you definitely you, really you know. definitely have an Instagram. I would like to thank whoever in your camp did this great graphic because there there's Anita Pointer and behind her is the cult radio marquee. I was like, <laughs> damn, that's cool. Right. You know, yes. Melissa did that. Thank you, Melissa. She put that up yesterday and today and yeah. And then Safe Safe, my friend Safe Eildrum, he's my buddy. He drove me around today and. We've had a great day, and, and I'm just so happy. I'm just so, so happy. Is there any time at the museum, Anita, that you're ever there to meet fans? Yeah, see, I was there today. Okay. <laughs> I was there this week. I go well, maybe once a week. I know Donnell goes, must, must go every day. <laughs> wow. But I, well, I, I'm there I get up as much as I can, and I, you know, I run into people, and sometimes they recognize me, sometimes they don't. <laughs> <laughs> or they have that well, moment. And that's half the fun. Yeah, yeah. Or they have that moment where they're looking at you. They're like, "Is that no? Is that wait? No, that no, no." I, I just got this. I just got this funny <laughs> moment in my head. I've I've learned that when you go to movie premieres, you need to be careful because there's been many times I've been watching a film and I'm sitting there complaining about how terrible the film is, and here the actor or the oh. director is sitting next to me. And, and if you were if you were standing there and somebody was like, oh, those, those Pointer Sister clothes, they're just tacky. And then you, you could turn to them and be like, excuse I me? Hear, I did hear one lady one day, I was there last week, and she was saying, how do they move in those, how do they dance like that in those dresses? <laughs> I, those 
costumes. How do they dance in those costumes? <laughs> it, it's, right. it's too bad it's not Halloween time because you could turn around and place yourself like a mannequin. And then when people come up, you right. could go, boo. You know, that would be... <laughs> All right, Don- Donnell, what about you? Uh, website, Facebook, Twitter, all that kind of stuff for the Hollywood Museum. Oh, sure. The Hollywood Museum's website is www.thehollywoodmuseum.com. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, hashtag The Hollywood Museum. Perfect, perfect. Now, do we do we know, do we have an end date? I, not that I ever want to see it leaving, but how long is the exhibit going to be there? Because people need to go see it now. I know, they need to go now. Yeah. We don't really have an yeah, end date. Yeah, they need to come. Let's go. Yeah, they need to come this summer. Is and right? uh, because uh, would be there all summer. Yes. Yeah. All right, well, perfect. The exhibit, once again, it's called Ever After, um, seeing 50 years of the Pointer Sisters through the eyes of Anita Pointer. Anita, Donnell, I want to thank both of you for joining us tonight. It's been so much fun. Thank you, Terry. Thank you so much. And, and once we had a, a wonderful time. Thank well, you, Well, th- thank, thank you both you for coming on. Thank you. Once again, Anita, thank I've got to say that, that I want to... I want to thank you, Anita, once again for hanging out with us in Las Vegas. <laughs> I, I won't tell everybody. I, I love it. I'm so glad we did that. We experienced that night together. Yes. That's wonderful. Yes. I won't tell everybody what happened because what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> but. All right, ladies. Thank you so much, and have a. <laughs> thank you both so much, and have wonderful. a wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your weekend. <laughs> All right, bye bye. Thanks for you both. Bye, Bye, Anita. (laughs) Bye, Danelle. I'll talk to you soon, dear. Okie doke. Bye. All right, bye bye.